Today, I'm taking a look at the Polar Vantage V. Seven point one miles, eight minutes, ten seconds per mile today. A foggy run along the lakefront here in Chicago. An extremely humid run. It was just unbelievably thick air out there today. Uh, a great day though to take the Polar Vantage V out for my run. Uh, I've actually had this watch for about a week, and I've been running with both this watch and my Apple Watch plus the Stride Foot Pod just to have some comparison data points, but today was the first run where I ran with just the Polar Vantage V. Now, before I get into my detailed thoughts about this watch, I wanna go over disclosures. This is a watch that was sent to me by Polar for the purposes of review. However, they're not paying me to make this video or to use the watch. No one's gonna get a chance to preview any of my footage until it goes live on YouTube. Now, with the disclosures out of the way, let's talk about the Polar Vantage V. Now, this is a watch that I was extremely excited to get my hands on to test because it boasts that it has an ability to give you a power number without the use of a foot pod. So that's right, wrist-based power meter. Plus, Polar has always been a leader in the heart rate monitoring field. And so I was looking to see if I could also kind of ditch another sensor. Earlier this summer, I was running with both a watch, a chest strap, heart rate monitor, and a foot pod. So I was hoping with this watch, I could get rid of two of those sensors and go back to running with just the wristwatch. Now, in terms of the watch itself, I think it's an absolutely beautifully designed wristwatch. I love round face watches. That's just my very, very strong preference. I really like the way that this one looks. The color scheme I think is great. Uh, and it's got tons of buttons. Now in the summertime, I think we forget how important physical buttons are, but I'm starting to think about winter running as well. And once you start wearing gloves, having a, a touch interface is just extremely frustrating to work with. This has five buttons, so plenty of buttons for me to mash while I am running. It is a heavier watch. I don't know if it's the heaviest watch I've ever run with, but it certainly is heavy. I think part of that is the heart rate monitoring sensors that they put in here, plus the battery. The battery life on this thing is epic. I've charged it once so far, and it still has tons of battery life left. So it's just absolutely amazing in terms of charging. The charging mechanism is a little bit weird. The uh, magnetic connection wasn't very strong. The first time I tried to charge it, I actually didn't charge it because I didn't have things kind of like lined up right. But once you do get it charged, the battery lasts like forever. So uh, not a huge deal. The other thing that I like about it though, is that I can always see it. I don't know if I'm just getting old or what, but some watches I'm having a hard time seeing the data that it's trying to give me. Uh, this watch, I've never had a problem with it being bright enough. And if it is, one of the buttons on top here uh, is a button that makes it even another step brighter. And so uh, anytime that I thought maybe it's a little bit dim, I definitely was able to get it to the right level of brightness. So being able to see it has never been a problem. There are a lot of customizable views that I can set up. So I was able to see the data exactly in the way that I wanted to see it. I usually like to set up so I could see pace, power, and my heart rate in kind of a zone, uh, plus also distance run. So those are the data fields that I like, uh, so I can configure them exactly in a way that makes sense for me. So when I'm getting a quick glance 
at the data as I'm running, even if I'm working really hard, I always kind of know exactly where I stand. You could set up workouts. So if you are doing tempo workouts or interval workouts, uh, you could set it up so the watch kind of just beeps at you and tells you what you need to do next without you having to manually hit the lap, which there is a nice button on it. The big main button in the middle on the right side here uh, definitely is the one that you can very easily hit uh, and set your laps. But if you don't want to be constantly minding either your rest durations or your workout distances, that's something that you can automatically set up. It's not as easy as I would like for it to be, but it's definitely something that's doable uh, and it's worked out pretty well for me. The main things though that I wanted to look at on this watch were heart rate, power, and then of course uh, the pace and distance information, which for a GPS watch is gonna come from GPS. So first, in terms of heart rate, I was actually a bit disappointed. One of my runs over the past week, it gave me kind of a peak heart rate of 240, which I don't think my heart is capable of doing. I don't think anyone's heart is capable of doing that. Um, so that's certainly something that's going on. I think part of it is because this is a little bit heavier of a wristwatch. And so you kind of need it to be higher up from the wrist bone to get an accurate heart rate reading from the wrist. And I think that the weight kept making this thing jiggle, even though I had it kind of cinched down um, towards kind of my wrist bone because of the just the centripetal forces of it. And so I think that's what was happening and I wasn't getting a really great reading. A lot of my workouts, it seems like in the beginning, I'm getting a nice solid reading. And then after like a couple of miles in, after it jostles around a little bit, then uh, the heart rate reading isn't so great. So that was a bit of a bummer. In terms of the power numbers, the power numbers from the wrist, I'm not sure how they do it, uh, but the numbers, see, accurate's not the right word. I'm getting a power reading from it. And power is kind of, I think, my understanding of how kind of power works with runners is that it's kind of like, it's given to you in the unit of watts, but it might as well be like gigawatts or just like doubloons. It just doesn't matter the unit. I think you're getting a number. And I feel like the numbers I'm getting are analogous. So the peaks are coming at the right time, the peaks, the valleys are coming at the right times, and the distances between the deltas between the peaks and the valleys seem very consistent between both the foot pod and the wrist-based power meter. The numbers are just different. The po polar numbers are like a hundred more than the stride numbers or sometimes less than 100 more. So there's this off. It's almost as if they're off by like a coefficient, but the polar numbers are always higher, but the trends in the numbers and what I'm able to discern from the numbers, I think are relatively similar. So on kind of preliminary look after a week, I don't know if a week is really enough time. I think you need to spend kind of like months, seasons with it to really get a feel for just how close is one to the other um to get a, a definitive look on it but my kind of gut impression on it after a week so far about eight or nine activities is that the polar seems to be giving me a reliable power um reading which i'm finding just absolutely like magical i don't know how they do that the last main thing that i'm looking for in terms of a gps watch is how accurate is the gps tracing and how accurate is the pace and distance information? Because ultimately, I really don't care all that much about the GPS tracing. I care about the GPS tracing insofar as pace and distance data is derived from the GPS tracing. And here, I think that the compared to the Stride Foot Pod, for example, uh, again, is where the polar falls short. But I'm starting to think now that I don't think that any GPS watch can really compare to a good foot pod in terms of pace and distance. Uh, and I just think it's the differences in technology and specifically where I run. I run in an urban area, lots of skyscrapers. So two main runs that I want to look at, maybe three main ones that I want to look at to kind of give examples of where I, I just don't know that any GPS watch can give me a really great reading. Let's look at my 20 mile run from over the weekend. Uh, a part though that was very difficult for uh, the watch to get right was when I was crossing over the Chicago River. Uh, there I'm running like on a bridge that has an uh, uh, overpass on it. So there's kind of two layers. And so uh, I'm under like, a, not an underneath the bridge, but like there's an overhang. 
And so that was a difficult spot for it. Sometimes it surprises me and does a really great job. It's giving me extremely, extremely accurate readings of exactly where I did, where I suddenly stopped to go hit a water fountain and then jump back on the trail or where I went onto the water fountain and then on the way back went a slightly different route, different by maybe like 30 feet apart than the way that I went down. Sometimes for really no reason, it just kind of freaks out. Uh, and that's something that I saw on my run the following day, actually the day after the footage that you saw, uh, I did uh, a tempo run where I did an out and back. And when I hit the turn, I think that's some of the part where GPS has problem with that really minute detail. Um, it thought that I was doing something really different and had me cutting over like a highway and a, around a corner. And so there I had some difficulties with the GPS tracing. And so uh, the run that I just talked about, that tempo run, that was where I took it a step further and then paired the stride foot pod so that way I could get information from that with this watch, which is something that's definitely doable. I thought I'd be getting pace and distance information from the watch that way. Uh, it turns out that I think the way I have it set up, I'm only getting power numbers from the stride foot pod. And uh, so I was a little bit, I got a little bit kind of confused as I was running. Uh, I thought I had run further than I had, and it turns out that I did. The GPS on the watch was shorting me by a significant number of miles uh, over the, the work period of my tempo run, which was supposed to be six miles. Uh, it gave me 5.5. Uh, where I thought I had run six, um, but fortunately I was able to kind of figure out exactly how far I did run after the fact. When I later mapped it on map my run, uh, the amount of time that I had started running at the tempo pace and then ended, and I was able to find that easily by the way that Polar kind of tracks my activity, um, it ended up being about 5.82. And now that 5.82 is also an estimate because it's not exactly where I run. It, I ran, I marked it on the map where I believe I ran, but I don't think that is quite as accurate as it could be either. And it's also an estimation because it doesn't track what I actually ran. So it, around a quarter mile difference from a five and a half mile run, I think is substantial. And that also affects pace when you're talking about how far you've run. I mean, distance equals right over, rate equals distance over time. And so uh, the amount of time I'm assuming is being calculated correctly. Uh, if the distance is off, then the rate's gonna be off. That kind of threw me off mentally for a run that I knew was gonna be tough anyway. Uh, and so that was a bit disappointing and that that happened. And so what I'm gonna be looking forward to doing in the future is I'm gonna see if I can get, I don't, I like the power rating from the wrist, that's fine, but I wanna try and find a way if I can get distance and pace data from a foot pod because in my urban setting where I get a lot of interference from skyscrapers and things like that. And for example, if you look at the tracing of like the last like two blocks where I'm leaving the park and getting closer to home, uh, that thing has me running like through buildings. Uh, so uh, by the GPS tracing that I got, and it makes sense. Cause then if you look at it from street view, then you're going to see that, uh, there are, you know, they're not skyscrapers. Uh, I would call them like mid rises. Uh, I think those buildings are probably less than 15 stories or so on each side. Uh, but maybe in that kind of range. And so uh, they are tall and I'm running like right next to them along the sidewalk. So I can understand that the GPS reading could be a little bit difficult to pick up there. So uh, some issues with the GPS. I don't know that there is any GPS watch though that's out on the market that can do better than that though. If you guys think that there is, let me know. I'd love to take a look at it, but I think that's something that pretty much is gonna happen with all of the GPS watches. And so it's not so much an issue of Polar versus another brand's GPS watches. I think it's an issue of GPS as a technology versus FootPod as a technology. So ultimately I was hoping to, to get rid of all of my sensors and just have the watch. The problem being that this doesn't have any way to store music on it. So even if I could get rid of all of my sensors, if I do wanna to listen to music, I'll have to bring a phone, which is something that I've been able to shed with the Apple Watch lately. So some decisions. I really, really do like this watch. It's been great to live with. I'm gonna keep running with it for another couple weeks to get it uh, a little bit more testing out of it, get a better feel for it. So stay tuned for that. But overall, it's not getting me quite everything that I'm looking for in a watch. 
Now, granted, I don't think this is a watch that is necessarily geared towards me. Uh, it has just a bunch of other multi-sport uh, tracking capabilities in it. I only run with it. That's the only thing that I care about. Uh, and so uh, a little bit different of a use case than probably what this watch is for. At $499, it does put it at the higher range of uh, GPS activity trackers. Um, is it something that I would necessarily look for, especially since I think that I would still want to have a foot pod attached? I might look at the Polar Vantage M, which is a lot cheaper. You're losing the wrist-based power and you're losing the barometer, which for someone like me, I, I don't necessarily need the barometer, but as I'm starting to realize, even a flatlander who likes flat road marathon races, uh, I still need to do some sort of hill work. I need to do some sort of altitude, not training, but I need to run some hills and know, have a better idea of what my altitude changes are like. And so the barometer is something that I've been much more interested in lately. And so that's another reason why I want to keep training with this Polar Vantage V for a while. Before I go, I do want to remind you guys about the charity runner for this week. This week, it's Jerry Williams running the Chicago Marathon for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I've donated $70 to his fundraising efforts. I'll post a link in the description in case you'd like to learn more. That's all I have for today, everybody. Thanks so much for making it all the way to the end of this very long video. Uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. Yo, what's going on?